Um, it's going to be an exciting couple of next weeks. We're going to be a lot of fun back there. Anyway, Drew, I think I got the effect on my voice. I feel like maybe I'm there. No? No? I just feel like I'm singing into a trash can. I'll fix it. It's okay. <laughs> hey, we have a sermon series we call The Truth of God. We've had a lot of people um, respond over the last month. It's been great. Hopefully, uh, you've been blessed. But I don't know. I've been blessed just getting the messages ready. Um, August 20th is going to be our grand opening. And I think I said that last week, but in case you haven't heard that, um, we're going to kind of wade through the summer. We might get done with things in there um, the first or second week in July, but we're going to save our grand opening to when we think people uh, are more likely to rally together. And at that time of year, about August 20th, LPS will be back in the school. It'll be a great time for us to get together. Uh, the reason we have the sermon series, Truth of God, is because um, we think there's an attack on truth. Uh, we think there's a, sometimes there's an attack on specifically the Bible. And so we want to talk about uh, the truth of God. If, if there is a truth, then if you believe that there's a God and that there's truth, you believe that there's purpose and truth for your life and a way to live. And I think it's, even though that's maybe a simple concept that we believe together, um, we've talked about that the last couple of weeks, and, and if, you, if you haven't been here, you know, maybe look them up on our YouTube channel or Facebook uh, or our website and kind of catch up on that. But it, it makes a big impact about how you will live and what you know. And so if there is a God and there is truth, uh, then there is a purpose. You know, if there isn't a God and, and, there, and there was no truth, there would be no purpose. And uh, so... I don't, I don't know if you're like me, but I like to hear stories. I like to tell stories, and I like to hear stories. I, mostly, I like to, to hear stories about people from other people. You know, you, you don't get a chance to know everyone, so it's always neat to hear stories. And you really can, uh, I don't know if you have a friend that's a great storyteller, but they're, usually they're kind of the fun people to be around, especially, you know, over dinner or something like that. And so I like to hear stories. And so this week, I decided, you know, kind of to fit the theme with the truth of God, but let's look up some stories. There's, pe there's people that have done great things in our culture, and it would be neat to kind of look up some stories. And so some of you have, hit, probably all of you have heard of Sam Walton, you know, Walmart. The guy that started Walmart paid his way through the University of Missouri by working as a lifeguard, a newspaper delivery boy, and a waiter. When he graduated, he took jobs at J.C. Penney's and DuPont uh, plant before he uh, served in World War II. After the war, Walt was determined to open his own variety store, and he pooled together his money while uh, he saved in the military with a loan from his father-in-law and bought a Ben Franklin store in Newport, Arkansas. Walt supplied customers with a wide variety of goods at low prices and kept them low by buying, buying uh, high volume from wholesalers. And the store was highly successful, and w then Walt opened his own store, Walton's Five and Dine, uh, five and Dime, and in 1962, Walton introduced the first true Walmart uh, in Arkansas. That store, like his others, turned a nice profit, and Walton began to expand the franchise across the country, uh, making it the world's largest retailer by 1991. He reigned as America's richest man from 1985 to 1988, and if he were alive today, He'd be the world's richest man with a wealth that would double that of Bill Gates. Um, Sam died in 1992 at age 74 of cancer. Another guy I read a story about this week was Paul Anderson. He's considered by many people the strongest man to ever live, and he lived in the uh, competed in the 1950s. Uh, everybody's got their opinion, but this is a really cool story. He set and rebroke countless re records, um, and the numbers speak for themselves, and some of his lift have been disputed because it's, it's so massive that people have a hard time believing it. Uh, and, uh, and these are just some of the numbers I got. Uh, his squat and lifting was 1,200 pounds. Unbelievable. His bench press without a bench press shirt on, uh, which aids people to do that today, was 628 pounds. His deadlift was 820 pounds. His clean and press was 408 pounds. And he won uh, the world championships in 1955. There's so many lifts that this guy did and then broke later 
it's just unbelievable. And to see pictures of him is, is, is just, uh, it's unbelievable. Anyway, he died in 1994 at 61 years old. and said he had a rare kidney disease that he was born with. Another guy that you got, my, everyone has heard of in this crowd um, is uh, Steve Jobs, you know, Apple computer. In 1976, he built uh, his first personal computer in his parents' garage. In 1980, um, he develops Apple and it goes public. And after one day of trading, Jobs is worth $239 million. He's 25 years old. Uh, in 1984, Apple launches the Macintosh, the best computer with a screen built in. And one year later, Jobs would leave Apple. In 1986, Jobs bought Pixar Animation Studios for $10 million. And in 1995, they released Toy Story, the first movie made with uh, computer an animation entirely. And it changes it forever. And when P Pixar goes pu uh, public, Jobs became a billionaire. Okay. In 1996, with Apple dying and about to be sold off or killed, Jobs returns and becomes the CEO and he takes a $1 salary. In 1998, Apple releases the iMac and becomes the fastest selling personal computer ever. Apple immediately returns to being profitable and makes uh, money for four quarters in a row. In 2001, Apple introduced their first retail store and releases the iPod. Some of you guys have those. Now there's uh, lots of stores. Um, in 2003, Apple launches iTunes Music Store, which began the transition away from illegal digital music, which many of you have enjoyed. Don't shake hand, don't don't raise your hands on that. This is going on, on the internet, um, and, and uh, got people to start downloading music legally. In uh, 2007, Apple introduces the iPhone. Um, some of you guys have those today. In 2011, the Apple Company. Uh, Jobs starting his parents' garage would briefly be the world's most valuable co uh, company. On August 9th uh, in 2011, for a few hours, Apple's market cap hit 342 billion, while Exxon Mobil's was at 341. That same uh, summer, Apple lists more cash reserves than the U.S. Treasury. <laughs> At 56, Jobs dies of pancreatic cancer. Well, I like to tell the stories because they're neat stories, but I also, in telling the stories, if you noticed, uh, all the people that I'm talking about, and there's these stories go on and on, they're incredible feats of strength and unbelievable business decisions and incredible wealth. The stories go on and on, but uh, they had an end. And um, it, it's kind of interesting because the Bible tells us throughout that uh, people lose naturally in the fallen world. People lose naturally in the fallen world. If there's truth, there's going to be a few things that are just set in stone. We, we've talk, we talked about uh, natural law, and uh, we've talked about sin, and we've talked about different things. And, and now in the sinful, broken world, in the natural world, people lose and it's kind of interesting, um, is that true or is it not true? And you think of all the people who have done great and exciting things, and, and still, at the end, uh, there's a loss. In, in these three cases, um, pretty recently, um, you know, from the 60s to the 90s, we've lost some great people. But at, at the end of these great success stories, there's still a loss that follows. And, and Psalms 103, 15 through 16 <coughs> tells us about this. It says, As for man or mankind, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in the field, for the wind passes over and it's gone, and, it, and its place knows it no more. Uh, mankind, people, individuals, we're here for a short amount of time, and the Bible's been telling us this uh, over and over for uh, since the uh, original sin, and, and, and yet I think sometimes we look at life like that's not really the way it is. Um, God tells us, don't live for things that do not last. Um, and I think sometimes uh, we get into a pretend mode. And I'm not talking about a child who pretends. I'm talking uh, about adults and the way we live and the way we teach each other. What, what, what do we live for? Um, I was kind of thinking about how to state this in a way that uh, we would understand. And I was thinking, okay, well, we've got the Lincoln Marathon. Do you ever have a friend that is always in the process of getting in shape? 
They're always in the pro, but they're never in shape, you know? Like I've been in the process of losing some weight for like three years. The process is long, you know. It's, it's so long it doesn't happen apparently. But but have you ever had that? Like the person is uh, you know in Advocare or Beach by there, and they're always getting. In, what are you what are you doing? Well, I'm getting in shape. Well, I thought when I talked to you last time, you're getting in shape. Yeah, but I'm good at getting in shape. And then you talk to him, you know, another year later or something. I'm getting in shape. Well. You just told me that last year you're getting in shape and you're still, how long does that take? But we're, we're getting, we're kind of, and at some point until something major happens, we're just kind of pretending, kind of like uh, fake book, right? The fake book, Facebook that we put, put pictures on, where every couple is more happy than you, right? Every couple is more happy because they're always smiling in all their pictures. I, I guarantee you, I get a chance to see the other side of people sometimes. They're like, smile, you smile. Selfie, right? It's it's not it's not true, you know. You have to kick the kids from a, but their families look so happy on the fake book, the Facebook that that uh, it's kind of pretending. We're kind of pretending, and and we're and we're always, you know, we're gonna have a good time. Um, we're trying to have a good time. Uh, how are you doing? Oh, it's great. I'm gonna get this job, and then when I get the job, I'm finally I'm gonna be happy. I'm just uh, it's gonna happen. I'm getting happier. Look, look at my Facebook. I smile all the time, talking about it. No, now that's not going to work. But if I just, I'm going to start a deal and I'm going to get a little bit more money. And when I get that more money, then I'm going to be, then I'm going to be good. I'm going to be secure. I'm going to have, wait, if, wait, now I'm upset because I don't have the relationship I want, but I'm going to get a relationship I want. And when I get that relationship, now I'm going to be happy. We, we have this pretend and we live life. And I think some of the reasons that we have ultra successful people that uh, don't have the Lord in their life is because we we teach each other to pretend. We really do. And if there's a truth, where's that truth come from and what is it? Well, we know it's from the Bible. We wouldn't know anything is true without God. Without God, you could know nothing true. You gotta have a truth giver. But if we know that, then why pretend? We, we pretend that if uh, our kids are educated and wealthy, they're going to somehow uh, be happier than not. Uh, it's gonna protect them. Um, if, if our kids are in a relationship, that it's gonna fulfill all their insecurities. I mean, look at how many athletes are so great. And, and we're not talking about Christians don't be successful, Christians don't be, Christians don't be professional athletes. No, on the contrary, it gives us an amazing platform to do ministry. Great, let's do that. But without the perspective, without the truth of God, when that's what life is about, it, we start pretending that those things, and we're shocked and surprised that worldly things do not sustain our life. And, and, and what's interesting is, uh, in the natural world, in the world that we're born into, uh, given to ourselves, we lose. Our life is, our moral life is going to be over. You do not win. You, you can fake the picture. You can fake fulfillment in the world all you want to. Uh, you can pretend like money, you know, does it all or a relationship does it all. Those things are for God, okay? God's to fulfill us. But, but if we don't have the truth, we pretend. Like a, like a child pretending with action figures or Barbie dolls or so. We pretend that life somehow settles itself. If we're just, I don't know, in a pocket of 40 years, successful or relationship, selfish, somehow we can fulfill ourselves, I think it's, it's, it's not true. So when we're, when we're talking about speaking of truth, we've been looking at the statements truly, truly, or when Jesus says, truly I say to you. In Mark chapter 3, verses 28, it says, truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. You know, blasphemies talks about when uh, evil that you speak. So when you speak evil, uh, it's, it's kind of considered blasphemy. And so uh, the Lord tells us, listen, truly, I'm telling you something here, and, and I'm telling it firsthand, and, and, and we need our sins forgiven, and we need our blasphemies forgiven. And in Matthew 18, 3, it says, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, when, when the Lord puts in the front of a phrase, truly, it's interesting. Um, it's kind of like when we say uh, something we agree with in church, we say, amen, 
right? We're saying, so be it, basically the phrase is. I agree with that. That's true. So be it. Well, when God says it, it's, it's, you know, it's amazing. But, but he's saying, um, so be it, or it is this way, or truly, truly, I say to you, he's making a statement firsthand that he knows is eternal and it's true. He's, he, he's speaking the truth. He's actually maybe speaking it for the first time. It's interesting when um, he's up on the cross and we talk about this, you know, usually Good Friday, but he, he turns to the man who has faith on the cross and he says, truly, truly, I say to you, you'll be with me today in paradise. It's interesting. He's, he's saying, listen, this is true because everything was created through me and I make truth. Truly, this is going to happen. It's, it's incredible. It's an incredible statement when God says this. In Luke uh, 23, 43, he says, truly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. In John 8, 51, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Isn't that interesting? God tells us we need to become like children. And if we keep his word, we'll never see death. Is that true or not? Is, is, it, is it the way to live or is it not the way to live? It's interesting because I think if we could talk to God, we'd say, well, truly, Lord, if, if, if um, my wife or husband would obey me better and do the things that I'd like them to do, then truly I'd be happy, Lord. I'll be fulfilled. Uh, truly, if I get the job I need with the money I need, then truly, Lord, I'm going to... And, and so we would make these truly statements back to God. And, and are they true or not? Are the way, is the way we're raised and what, and what we put our focus on, is that God's kingdom or our kingdom? Because I think we pretended like it was God's kingdom and it's really our kingdom. And I think what happens is when we come together as a church... And what we're really doing is living for temporary things, for worldly things. We're pretending and we're hurting other Christians. You know our sin, the reason a sin is a sin because it hurts and kills other people. We don't think about that. But just like the children of the world were up here uh, last week, I don't know if you were blessed by the children of the world, his little feet. His little feet, the mission group. I, I mean, it was amazing. And you don't know what sin started whatever happened in their culture for them to be an orphan, for their parents maybe to be martyred and things like that, but yet it happens. And, and just because we can't see how our lifestyle and our sin hurts other people, it doesn't mean that it doesn't. It means that it does. God tells us it does. It's the only way we know anything is true. So how do we live? I think we live a little bit angry. And, and I'd like to say that it's people out there that live angry. But I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I mean, I think that happens too. I think some people are very angry. But I think there's enough anger to go around right here in the church. We're angry at God for the things that we cause, are we not? Are we not angry at God because uh, we have to die? Because we get sick? Do we not get angry because we've lost people close to us? Do we not? I think we do. Do we not get angry that we've lost people close to us and that we ourselves struggle with our health? Do, I mean, we don't like that our mortal bodies have to die, right? We don't like that, and we get mad at God. Yet it, it's through our sin where we die, and God, yet he saves us, and we can be a new creation, and he, and he, and he solved the problem. We get upset with the mortal consequence. And then, I think, because the Bible's true, and we just need a little bit of faith to start doing the things that we need to do in this life and being fulfilled, instead we believe a lie, we start living our life that way, and then we're mad at God when we're not fulfilled. How many people are mad at God because uh, they lived their life in sexual immorality before they were married? It ripped them down. You know, it, it ruins part of their life, and they're saying, God, I'm, why did this happen? I'm mad at you. Well, you didn't... How are you mad at God? We're the ones that were disobedient. We, we do uh, substance abuse and different things, and we, we get on the floor, we get mad at God, we get in our relationships, and, and we get into them wrong, not in a biblical way, but in a worldly way. We pretend that, oh, that'll just, that's just going to work out, and we, we never let God have anything to do with our relationships, and we're mad at Him when we end up by ourselves, unfulfilled in conflict. Do, do we not do that? I think we do, and I think we pretend like we're not doing that. And I think when we come together as a church body, as believers, what happens is people see our lives. Isn't it interesting that people can see your life now from day to day, and you can actually promote what you do with your life on social media. 
It, do you promote your life in Christ on the things that you're concerned about? The way, or do you promote your success? Do you promote your happy relationships? Do you promote your unbelievably joyful vacations and things like that? Is that what we promote? I think it is. And I think because we do that, we teach one another not to be encouraged for the Lord. We teach each other to be encouraged for earthly things. And, it, and it's not the truth. I think we should change how we look at it. Yes, we do things in the world, we live the world, but the Bible says we're not of the world. Is that true? It's true if we, if we start living that way. It's interesting when we accept salvation and we still just roll around in the world. We roll around and we, we try to draw our insecurities from the same things that everybody out there is. And so we end up being angry at God the same way anyone who hasn't accepted salvation is angry. I'm trying to think of a way for us to connect as a church. And I'm thinking, listen, we have to live our life in truth. We have to look at, there's great stories. Where are these guys at? Sam Walton was a great, successful business. I can't even imagine what him and Steve Jobs were worth combined. Where are they at? I can't shake their hand. Yeah? I can't, I, I, I can't find them right now. Right? All the money, did they, they, did they stick it in their coffin? Can they buy stuff six feet under in the dirt? They cannot. And so unless they did stuff that built the kingdom, what good was it? And you can say, Austin, well, that's just, yeah, I don't care. Right? There's a truth. And, and maybe if one or two of these guys were Christians, I think the weightlifter guy was, I read about it. You can lift a whole car, and guess what? In 20 years, no one cares. There's a new guy that lifts it, right? And if you don't use that to grow God's kingdom and you use it to build your kingdom, it's a lie and it, and it goes away. And the worst part about that is it's in sin. It's evil. It's, it's, you're speaking of evil. What, what's not true? What's not true? What's temporary? What's of the world? What's evil? So if you live your life and you build your kingdom, you're building your kingdom and it's a lie. It does not last. When the church comes together, we're to admonish one another. It's interesting how we would encourage one another to live. I think the main thing is by our lives. Yeah, we come together to praise the Lord, but we live our lives in worship. You know, sometimes we call it, we say, this is a worship service. It's a service where we celebrate our, uh, the life in Christ. We celebrate what God's done for us. But listen, it's more amazing when we come and sing praises to God because you worship God with your lifestyle. Everything that you do this week, whether you're a professional athlete or you're a great businessman, and there's a great story to tell, the story that you want to focus on is the Lord Jesus and his kingdom. Amen? Amen. So there's, do we live our life in truth? Do you believe, God, that you'll never see death, that you're forgiven? Do you believe that that's what's true? Why, why do we teach something else? Why do we pretend? I think moving forward at Cross the Line Church, it's going to be important that the body of believers not only agrees with the Bible, but they live their life in truth. Isn't it sad when someone only comes to church because they disagree with the same things that other people disagree with? You know what I'm talking about? If we don't like the same things, that it unifies us. No, we, so much more than that. The church beats back the gates of hell. People get saved because of our lives, because we have faith this big, whole mountains get moved in people's lives, and, and they're transformed and they're made new. Isn't that exciting? Well, it's exciting when it's lived in truth, but it's terrible when it goes on in the lie and in death. And so we're talking about the truth of God. Uh, we're talking about his word, right? We're talking about all the biblical truths that there are, but, but we're really starting to speak about your life. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that your life is so important? When we talk about the truth of God, we're saying, how does, how does that look in your life, literally? How, how do you live? How do you teach? Would you please teach my children the truth by how you live? When we come to the church, I want you to live for Christ so my kids can learn from you, so that my family can learn from you, so my friends can walk in here who don't know Christ, and they look at your life, and they look at truth in the world. That city on a hill, right? The salt of the earth kind of stuff. Because it's true. It's amazing what happens when believers come together and they live their life in truth. 
every week we go to communion, and uh, we know that the blood of Jesus and the broken body, he saves us. It's true. We live our life to champion that in the community and together this morning. We take the things that Jesus said, truly, truly, so be it. God spoke it into creation as hardline eternal truth. And he said, listen, you got to live like children. You got to be, become like these, faith like a child kind of stuff. Listen, um, all the children of God will be forgiven their sins and all the evil things that they've said and done. Isn't that amazing? That has to be true. Because in the natural, people are going to lose. But eternally, they don't lose. Not if they love the Lord. And if we believe the words of the Lord, he says, he gives us everlasting life. He remakes us. We're a new creation. We're born again. We need born again. Because in the natural, human beings lose. Even the ones that have a billion dollars. One day, find out they have pancreatic cancer. And they're not going to be around too much longer. And I wonder how it is that they live so much life, 57 years, 61 years, 74 years, and they thought they were going to escape. And maybe they didn't, but many people do. And I think the reason people think they escape, it's not because they're stupid. I don't think it's stupid. I think it's because Christians live a lie. We accept salvation, but we don't live truth. We still, we still put our insecurities and our securities and our relationships and the people, and we say, this is going to fix it. This is going to fix it. And people like whatever story we want to tell, that they don't see it. But they need to see it from us. It's time that they see it from us. And so today as we go to communion, don't, every week, it's, it's time to believe God. It's time to have truth in our life. But it's time for us to commit that people don't look at our life and see a lie or, or something that's not true. They see God's truth at work in us. That, that you know, in the spiritual realm, huh, you got a big banner. Hitler, this, now that person is saving people. What are they doing? God just say they're living in truth. They have faith this big. So as we go to communion today, we're going to pray. We need to make decisions to live in truth. Every person here knows there might be an area where there's no truth in it. God doesn't get to be in that area of our life, and it's, it's time we let him in uh, because it's sinful not to. It hurts people, and people die. And when we have a great story, <laughs> the story is that people get saved. I hope that if your children is a you know, if your child is a professional athlete or a great businessman, the moral of his story is that he loves Jesus or she loves Jesus. I hope the stories that you tell in this community are people getting baptized and one to Christ. I hope when you have stuff at your house, the focal point is the Lord Jesus. Why? Because it's true. We need to make decisions like that at communion. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the chance to get together, to come together, to worship your name. We want to have faith to step out, to do a little bit of ministry, and you throw the doors open, Lord. Every person in here has a story, and right now it's of the world or it's of you. Lord, I pray that every decision made at Cross the Line Church tonight will end in you will end in truth and will put glory in the name of Jesus. Amen.